Well, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your willingness to um, let us start early. We seem to have had a, a problem in the scheduling matter in the other case. So thank you very much for your patience and your cooperation. This is the time set in State versus Arnett, our cause number one, CACV 130420. Let's begin with introductions of, of counsel. Your Honor, Robert Greer on behalf Thank you, sir. Your Honor, Jeff Cantrell with the Attorney General's Office for the 10 years and the Department of Environmental Policy. Thank you, sir. Let me go through a few preliminaries. Each side has 20 minutes. If the appellant would like to reserve time for rebuttal, it would be useful to the court that when you go to the lectern that you let us know how much time you'd like to reserve, and we will do our best not to ask you so many questions that we eat up your time. So we'll try and, and honor that request. Let me advise the parties that we have read the briefs, we have conferenced the case, we've discussed it, we're familiar with the issues, and you might wish to take into account in your remarks today our preparation. We are recording uh, the proceedings today, both audio and um, uh, video, and if you'd like to go to our website in a couple of days, you'll probably be able to see yourselves on the camera, and if not, uh, at a later time, I think we even post it on YouTube. I was about to say Facebook, and that didn't seem quite right. So. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and begin one last point. When you go to the lectern, because we are recording, if you could please restate your name. Thank you. Your Honor, Robert Greer, appearing on behalf of William Arnett. Um, this is a unique case in the sense that we've got a couple of issues that, as far as I know, have never been dealt with in the courts of appeal of this state. The first is a definition of owner under the statute involving uh, under uh, USTs. I've been using UST so long, I forget what it stands for, underground storage tanks. The, the, the simple problem we have is that the definition of owner changed over the three years that span, or excuse me, three times during the years that span this case. There's a 1989 definition uh, that was present in 1990 when uh, Yellow Cab first filed its notice of ownership or of, of uh, uh, the uh, presence of a UST. It was amended in 1994, which 
statute was in effect in 95 when the consent order uh, was uh, entered and was amended again in 1997 which was the form that the definition had when this lawsuit was filed in 2010. Uh, I argue in the brief that those definitions and those changes don't amount to much because the scope of the regulation, the, the reach of it, attempted to bring in all those who had a, an interest in the property and more importantly an interest in the underground storage tanks. Uh, in the 1989 uh, version, uh, it actually uh, says a person who owns property at the time an underground storage tank is located on the property is the owner if, the, after making all reasonable efforts, the department is unable to determine the identity of the person who owns or operates the tank. And I suggest that that means that ownership on the part of the fee owner is sort of a fallback position as of 1989 uh, because they're looking primarily to those who operate the tank. Now, that was amended in 1994 uh, to include those who uh, own, uh, let me get the right language so I don't, own or control the property. That by definition, Siobhan, though, even under the 89 definition, would would it be limited to the person who operated the tank, or would it also would it also include the owner? Well, the statute one could read it to be limited to the to the uh, operator. I don't think it is that narrow because of the common law. Uh, I mean, we admitted to ownership both in pretrial and the court found as a matter of law that Mr. Arnett was the owner. We can make a technical argument that he was not, uh, but it's too late to do that now. And, and more importantly, as a fee owner, he had ownership of the tanks anyway because they're fixtures on the property. And that was what, uh, uh, one, I mean, one can warp the statute to make that argument. But I think the intent of it, at least in 1989, was to reach the one who uh, really had primary responsibility for the tank and that may include operator, but I, uh, I cannot exclude by the language of the statute an owner as well. It certainly, the scope certainly uh, was made clearer in the 1994 uh, definition of it because it, it occurred, it, uh, either ownership or control was sufficient to require uh, one to report the tank and to take care of any problems with it. It's made even Clearer in 1997, it was uh, extended to anyone who's got a legal, equitable, or possessory interest. So control and possession are roughly the same thing. But in any event, one, if there's any ambiguity to the 1989 statute, uh, one can read the later amendments of it in peri materia with the 1989 version and conclude based on the policy underlying the statute that they want to extend the reach to anybody who had anything to do with that tank, be it owners or operators. That becomes important only because when Yellow Cab in 1990 and again in 1993 and again in 1995 represented that it was the owner of the tank, it was under the statute accurate. You know, there was no misrepresentation. Let me raise a question about that point. Sure. Oh. <clears throat> Assuming that, uh, that we agree with you on the argument you just made, uh, Mr. Arnett was, he was correct then when he represented that an owner was Yellow Cab, but he too was an owner. And what causes me concern is that he went halfway down the field, but didn't go all the way down the field to explain who the owner is. And I don't see anything in the statutory um, this, uh, structure that uh, says there can only be one owner, uh, that you can have multiple owners. And so in that sense, he was incomplete in the disclosures that he made. And on top of that, you have the statements that he, he uh, ascribed to and um, accepted uh, in, the con uh, in the 95 consent decree, that he was the owner. 
Well, the, uh, the excuse, he said that Yellow Cab was the owner. Um, and, uh, and the argument is. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. Yes, f forgive me. Yes, um, Yellow sure. Cab. Yeah. And, and it's a sin of omission, according to the trial judge. And your question mm -hmm. is to mm -hmm. why isn't that a sin of omission? Uh, really? Because it, right. Well, there is no question that each owner has a duty to report. Uh, the statute says that. But the statute also says that either owner may discharge the, re the specific responsibility. The evidence is, and excuse me, that same statute, 491016A, says that owners and operators are jointly and severally liable. That is, even though either one may discharge a specific responsibility, if that responsibility is not discharged, both are liable. That becomes important because that put that charges ADEQ with the knowledge that uh, there are and may be multiple owners. Uh, and uh, in fact, the evidence is that 60% of USTs have a different property owner than operator. That is, uh, that's the knowledge base from which ADEQ is operating. Um, and that, that would make sense to me if there's no affirmative representation from Yellow Cab that, that we're the owner operator. Uh, but it, if are, is ADQ responsible for uh, looking past what somebody's represented and, and said, well, this is what they've said, but we're nevertheless going to, what would be the purpose of looking? If someone is there and willing to take responsibility, uh, what's, why, why do they have an incentive to go look for for someone else and until something happens like in here yeah. where there's a well and, yeah, and factually of course the only reason they chased mr arnett was yellow cab was no longer able to fulfill the its agreement to uh, clean up the property um, and so i i guess the i've not thought about this in this context but i think you're asking is uh, uh who assumes the risk that they haven't uh, joined everybody in the right in, in the lawsuit to begin with. But don't they specifically ask someone to identify who the owner is? And if if someone says I'm the owner, isn't that essentially a representation? I'm the only owner. Well, why why wouldn't someone say, well, I I'm the operator, but the land is owned by someone else, but I'm taking responsibility sure. for it. Well, and and when the question was posed cleanly, in the in the forms they used to get state funding where you identify yourself as the operator or the fee owner or the facility owner, uh, Yellow Cab each time made it clear that it was not the uh, property owner. Uh, it's our contention that, see, see, that ties in to the requirement under the restatement of judgments, uh, 26, uh, so, uh, comment J, that really brings us here, and uh, that is, whether diligence is excused by the on the part of ADEQ when the uh, uh, twenty the comment F and all the case law that interprets it requires some level of diligence. In other words, the strength of the misrepresentation uh, isn't as important as the availability of other information and whether. Uh, a party who is sought to be barred by res judicata uh, has exercised, has been reasonable at ascertaining the other information. Uh, and know, that's, a little, that's a different issue than the statutory construction. I, I get that. And Mr. Greer, I, 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 what troubles me here is we have a set of statutes, and they're like a box. And then we have the principles of res judicata and the point you're making now about diligence, and that's another box. And then we have a third box, which is your client, either on his own behalf or on behalf of the yellow cab, making a variety of statements regarding the ownership of this property. None, not all, which were consistent. Okay, but when he entered into legal, legally significant documentation, first the administrative order and then the consent decree in the '95 act in the uh, lawsuit. He represented that Yellow Cab was the owner. And given that background, I'm having a hard time squaring that we should somehow um, take the box of the statute and superimpose that into the box of res judicata 
and put a diligence obligation on the state in light of what Mr. Arnett was representing. Okay, and the trial court did the same thing. I know, so help me on this one, All right. okay? Um, sure. The, um, in every case that has interpreted uh, comment F of, uh, rule of uh, section 26, the, the extent of the misrepresentation wasn't the issue. The issue was whether uh, the party acted diligently, whether they availed themselves of reasonably uh, available discovery, uh, whether they were precluded from discovery altogether. One even went to, the, went to so far as to say uh, we will grant relief under this exception of race judicata only if there is no way they could have even realized it had a claim. Um, and, and I understand that the uh, uh, the quandary that we're in, because on the one hand we have these statutory requirements, on the other hand we have principles of race judicata uh, that. Uh, uh, ADEQ is relying on the exception to race judicata in order to uh, avoid the, the effect of the 1995 judgment and barring a claim. Counsel, uh, let me ask you, are, is your point that diligence is the only focus in looking at comment F? Or in other words, it, it, let's use a hypo where, you know, a rep and, and a true hypothetical where a um, an individual or an entity repeatedly makes a knowingly false representation over and over and over again with the absolute intention to mislead everyone. Um, it's a hypothetical, sure. right? Um, it would seem to me that a court could take that into account along with diligence and wouldn't have to ignore sort of what, what was behind the representation. I want to make sure I understand your argument. Sure. Well, if it is fraudulent, I mean, and there's a restatement provision that deals directly with if it's absolutely fraudulent, not the case we have here, of course, uh, and it's section 70 or 74, I forget which one. But that still includes the, uh, the diligence. I mean, I mean, if we put it in the context of, of, a, of a Rule 60 motion for new trial based on fraud, even that has to be brought within six months. Even if it's outright dog lion fraud, uh, there's still a procedural mechanism that trumps that. Rule 60 is a, is a, uh, a rule form of claim preclusion. And, and no one bats an eye about uh, uh, throwing out an untimely uh, claim that we ought to set aside this judgment because I was defrauded. Uh, there's got to be an end. And sometimes that policy uh, not to have serial litigation trumps even fraud. And, and I understand that, and, and the preclusive um, mechanisms that we're talking about, both procedural and the, you know, the substantive nature of the restatements reflect that. Yeah. Um, but couldn't have all, all of this been avoided if, if Yellow Cab indeed had said that it was an owner instead of the owner? Wouldn't your argument be a lot stronger? It would be stronger happened? then, that's true. Uh, but. Uh, and of course, we haven't gotten to the the uh, uh, the, uh, the statute that says you got to take. Uh, you're deemed to know that Mr. Arnett is the fee owner based on the recorded document. Does that necessarily establish that he's the owner of the the, the UST? Well, the court found it was. I mean, the, in 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 um, uh, finding of fact number six. The court found that Mr. Arnett was the owner of the UST because the UST was a fixture, and that's consistent with the common law. But is it is it also possible that someone who owns the land can just enter into an agreement with someone who's um, going to lease the land, and it, can they not contractually provide that if you put something on the land, if you have a storage tank, whether it's above ground or below tank, below ground, uh, that that's not part of that that ownership will remain with the the person who's leasing the land. Can it can it be handled just? Yeah, it through? can be handled that way. I mean, commonly a gas station, for example, is on leased land, and whether the underground tank to to pump the gas is part of the land or not, one that can be part of a contract. That is true. Well, but in the absence of that, 
<laughs> but uh, here wasn't there didn't wasn't there testimony that as you've just indicated 60 percent of the time it's not necessarily owned by the uh, by the fee by the landowner um, so if, if that's the case why would the state necessarily um, assume that because uh, mr. Arnett owns the land he would also necessarily be the owner of the tank well because uh, uh, an owner of the land well I, what you're saying is 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 should they uh, assume that um, there's some sort of a lease that separates the ownership uh, I dare say that the statute is broad enough that even if an owner says okay you lease it you're in charge of it uh, I don't think uh, an owner escapes the wrath of ADEQ if if they're so inclined even if it's been leased away I, I, I know I didn't answer your question but I, I, no, that, I lost it uh, can I reserve about two and a half minutes to Me? well and, and of course the the single uh, legal issue that I think um, really doesn't involve a whole lot of construction of facts is is the effect of uh, uh, of the notice statute of the recording statute uh, Arizona interprets it as being noticed to the world that mr. Arnett has ownership of the property and the the governing statutes 49 uh, regardless of the form puts the uh, the owner of the property as the owner of the UST if not mr. Arnett never would have been sued thanks May it please the court. My name is Jeff Cantrell. I'm with the Attorney General's Office and I represent the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. I'd like to follow up on some of the questions that have been already uh, presented. In the 1995 de definition of owner, the definition includes a statement where the owner of the property can be deemed the owner of the underground storage tank. However, the complete definition, if you follow the statute, if you follow the statute, gives a significant number of uh, exemptions to what the definition of an owner is. You're talking about, excuse me, the because uh, uh, I copied this certain of the statutes. You're talking about the original one in 1991, or the one amended in 94. In 94. Okay. At the time, this is the definition that was incorporated by the terms of the consent decree for definition of owner. Okay. So even though a person may own the property, if you look under um, 4910101A2, um, the person has not placed regulated substances. In A1, the person after due diligence didn't know that the tank was there. In B, a person who owns indicia of ownership uh, to protect a security interest. And in C, a person who owns indicia of ownership t because they acquired the property under foreclosure. So just because a person may own the real property, even under the statute in control at the time, means that the person is not necessarily absolutely the owner of the underground storage tank. But we, that, that's only for some narrow exceptions though, right? That, that's not, what, what is your, um, your position on the scenario where someone owns the land and just contractually agrees with someone who's going to lease the land that uh, you're gonna use this as a gas station, you're gonna put in a, an under, underground storage tank and you're gonna own that I'm the landowner, but you own the, the tank. Can a landowner do that and evade liability for the? Abs absolutely, a landowner can. It's the ownership of the tank is a is ownership of personal property in many respects, and it's a creature of contract. So the the owner of the property, and so the, is, the state cannot. The go state after the, cannot go the after landowner. owner of real property who's just a bare owner of real property. The state can pursue owners of USTs. The state can pursue operators of USTs, but cannot pursue a owner of real property on which he has no interest in the UST. On that point, where would I find the law that supports that point about who the state can pursue? The, um, Is it based on the definition in 49-1001.01? That's correct, yes. That's that's the that's the authority. Okay. That's what gives uh, ADQ the jurisdiction over the owners of the tanks and the operators of the tanks. Moreover, under forty nine ten oh two, 
each owner of an underground storage tank has the obligation to report the ownership of that tank to ADEQ. So if there are five different owners of the tank, each owner has to report their ownership to ADEQ. That is, that's in a real estate law analysis, that's similar to actual notice. That's the reporting statute. So in our case, we may have had constructive notice that Mr. Arnett owned the real property. However, when Yellow Cab submitted the uh, UST notification form to ADEQ, it reported itself as the owner of the, real, of the uh, underground storage tank. So we have actual notice of the UST ownership. In addition, in uh, three years later, in Exhibit uh, 44, Yellow Cab's attorney wrote to ADEQ indicating that it, it admitted, that Yellow Cab admitted that it was late in filing the 1002 notice of ownership. Um, and because 491002 only applies to owners, that is an admission that Yellow Cab was the owner by their counsel. So throughout this time period, ADEQ is operating on the basis that Yellow Cab is the owner and that it has no idea that uh, Arnett is the owner of the tank. Because of the fact pattern that we have, when the tank was first reported to ADEQ and Yellow Cab indicated that it was the owner of the tank, we have multiple documents and multiple representations by Yellow Cab that it was the owner of the tank. We have Mr. Arnett also verifying that Yellow Cab was the owner of the tank or agreeing with the facts stated in the um, consent order and in the consent decree that Yellow Cab was the owner, the owner of the tank. Over the 15 year period from 1990 when the tank was first reported to ADEQ until the uh, 2005 deposition by Mr. Arnett, we have, a we have no indication anywhere in the record that Arnett owned the tank. It was all Yellow Cab being the owner of the tank. What about the, um, the, uh, uh, um, the, forgive me, it's um, the, when, when Yellow Cab sought um, funding from the state uh, to help defray the remediation costs, I thought there were at least two submittals one in January 95, one in, I believe, in um, um, June of 95, in which Mr. Arnett signed as the tank owner. I think he also signed, if you look at, all, at the pattern of all those documents, all of those documents, there, there's a scattered pattern of how Yellow Cab represents the ownership of the tank but doesn't that, and so forth. I'm sorry, sir, uh, but I agree with you. I think one way to put it is scattered. Um, but does that put a duty of investigation on uh, ADEQ to determine who really is the owner? We don't Thus believe that, so. The rest judicata exception doesn't apply? We don't believe so, Your Honor, because uh, first of all, the determination of who the tank ownership owner is, and we had testimony from the State Assurance Fund, that's the SAF program that we're talking about, testimony from the manager of the State Assurance Fund, that by the time these files get to the State Assurance Fund, uh, ownership has already been determined. In addition, throughout this entire time period where ADEQ was working with Yellow Cab on the investigation and remediation, not once did Yellow Cab ever say, hey, listen, you've got the wrong guy. Or not once did Yellow Cab ever say, well, there's an owner that's not Yellow Cab that we need to look to towards as well. So, and that gets us to the, uh, the comment J is that we're not claiming that the misrepresentation was intentional. What we're saying is that under comment J, the even an innocent misrepresentation is sufficient to um, prevent Mr. Arnett from using the 1995 consent decree as a shield under res judicata against his personal liability as an owner. And he is an owner that is distinct as a separate general entity from the uh, from Yellow Cab. Uh, it's somewhat confusing and we, the situation is somewhat confusing in the fact that we have Yellow Cab has as its president our Bill Arnett but Bill Arnett also has his personal capacity. In his 2005 deposition, he admitted that he owned the tank in his personal capacity and that Yellow Cab operated it. So 
it's not as if we have just Mr. Arnett as a corporate officer who may have some liability. We also have his personal liability that may attach because of his personal ownership of the tank that he never, never transferred to um, Yellow Cap. That representation of the deposition of February 2005, though, is consistent with at least some of the documents that ADEQ had years earlier. Isn't that true? I mean, that's really with respect to the scattered representations. It's, it's consistent, but the question is, really what we're talking about is we're talking about what sort of diligence should DEQ have exercised in determining who was the true owner of the underground storage tank. And under, sec under Section 74 of the Restatement of Judgments, the standard is reasonable diligence. And in light of the fact that um, we have a statutory scheme that requires self-reporting of owners, owners, we have that each owner has a liability, a requirement under 491002 to report his ownership interest in the tank. Failure to do so subjects that person to a civil penalty. The fact that uh, Yellow Cab reported itself as the underground storage tank owner in Exhibit 10, that Yellow Cab's attorney admitted that Yellow Cab was not timely in reporting uh, under a statute that only applied to owners, that we have testimony that 60% of UST owners are not the same as the owner of the property, that for the 15-year period followed, neither our net Yellow Cab ever went to ADQ saying, hey, listen, as a matter of fact, this tank is owned by Mr. Arnett. That, AD, that Yellow Cab never disputed when it was working with ADEQ about tank investigation and remediation, that it was not the complete and total liable entity. That we have Arnett signing the consent order in which he agreed that the determination was Arnett, or that Yellow Cab was the owner of the tank, and he signed as president. He also signed the 1995 consent decree, agreeing to the facts that Yellow Cab was the owner of the tank, and that we have, after the consent decree was or signed, we have another 10 years of additional technical documents, many of which were signed by registered geologists or other certified engineers, registered engineers, professional engineers, submitted to ADEQ that reinforce that entire perception that Yellow Cab is the owner of the tank and the owner of the tank. So we have this <coughs> massive amount of information. You do, but it, it is not... You know, the best case for you is that 100% of those say Yellow Cab is the sole owner, and it's something less than that on this record, isn't it? It's perhaps less than that, but as I indicated, the ownership determination was made prior to those documents being sent into ADQ. The ownership determination was made when Yellow Cab admitted that it owned the tank, and we had testimony from DEQ that once that determination has been made, ADQ will only look to additional, additional owners if they have a situation where the owner can't be found or where the owner, the person identified as the owner disputes that ownership or there's some other active statement that says, listen, ADQ, you need to look at some other information. And, and you're saying that it was, was is it, forgive me, because this was not clear to me. Are you saying that ADEQ deemed it established, to put in the passive voice, that uh, Yellow Cab was the owner because of the 93 consent order? It determined that Yellow Cab was the owner based on the UST notification form that was submitted by um, Yellow Cab to ADQ in which Yellow Cab said it was the owner of the underground storage That tank. would have been back in 1990. 1990, that's correct. So that form and that form alone from the state's perspective establishes who is the owner and nothing else that comes subsequent really matters? No, if, if something comes up, in other words, um, and we have in the record testimony that, for example, if ADQ contacts the owner and says, hey, we've got an underground storage tank that's leaking, you need to, pursuant to statute, commence the investigation. If the owner at that time or any subsequent time says, I'm not the owner of the tank, Shell Oil is, for example, ADQ then goes to Shell Oil. If um, the owner continues to go proceed forward, continues to perform the work, expend funds investigating, never once raising the issue that it is not the owner. It's been identified as the owner, but never once challenges that determination. That's, ADQ has no incentive to go out and find who these owners of these tanks are. Well, let me ask, is, is and, and by incentive, do you also mean no duty? Well, I think ADQ has a duty to determine who the owners, who the, who the parties are who are liable under the statute. And it uses its 
information that it can to get to that point. For example, it finds an abandoned service station. It will search the deed records and so forth. But that's not, those aren't our facts. No, but it, it is, and let me, I want to make sure I understand your point, it, that if, if someone who is at least claiming to be an owner, and let's set aside the versus an for now, and is putting money into the project, if you will, right. um, that, that that sort of natural disincentive for someone to pay unless they, they're obligated to uh, effectively um, gives ADEQ the information that you believe is necessary. Is That's that correct. We have the entire structure of the underground storage tank program is one that relies on self-reporting. ADEQ does not go out and collect samples from the ground to determine what the concentrations of benzene are, for example. It tells the responsible party that it must go and collect those samples and report those samples to ADEQ. So this is not something where, as in a criminal exam, uh, prosecution, where the state is going out to collect all the evidence it possibly can. It relies on, it re relies on the assertions by the party. It relies on the statements by the party to go and collect the information and to do the investigation and to do the corrective actions as necessary. So really what you're saying in terms of diligence for purposes of the res judicata exception, the level of diligence or the extent of the diligence is informed by the system here, which is self-reporting. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a reasonable diligence standard in Section 74, and I think that's, that's the thing that needs to be borne in mind, is that this isn't an absolute diligence. This is... This is not an absolute duty to uncover. We have, by their very nature, underground storage tanks that are buried. It is impossible to scan a piece of property as you drive by and determine if an underground storage tank is there, absent a service station above it. And this is an old. Pro this is a program that has, by its very nature, extends liability for releases to releases that occurred before 1986. So there is no statute of limitations. It's a retroactive statute, and th there are. I'm sure many cases where underground storage tanks still exist and yet no service station exists above ground. So absent some sort of ground penetrating radar or having the USS Enterprise scan the subsurface, it would be impossible to determine that the tank is there absent some other information, which in our case is a representation by the owner that I'm the owner of the tank. I apologize for free associating here. I'm just kind of back to an earlier point. If um, let, Let's say the somebody owns the land and there was the tank was already there um, can the landowner say i'm going to lease and wants to enter into a lease with someone else can the landowner say i'm going to enter into a lease with you and i'm transferring ownership of the the tank to you as the the lessee um, is that would the state not still go after the There's owner in, in that circumstance in the statute that was existent at the time and also today if a person conducts due diligence before acquiring the property and doesn't know that the tank exists, they can escape liability if they perform certain subsequent actions, for example. Okay, but now they the know. I'm, I'm, I'm <coughs> hypothesizing they know the tank's there, and they just they don't want to be the owner of the tank. Somebody is going to lease the land, and they want to use, use the tank. Can the owner say, I'm transferring ownership? I, I suppose they could say, I'm going to either remove the tank, you can put in your own, but I don't want to own this tank. But is that is that possible? It's, I think it's possible, but let me make sure I understand the, the hypothetical. Are you saying that if a person acquires the property with a tank on it and then immediately sells the tank to the property lessor who is going to operate the service station? Right. Are, we, are we talking about something else? Right. Okay. And, and in that scenario, does the property owner um, evade or no longer have responsibility? Un under the definition of an owner of a tank, an owner of a tank is a person who acquires the property and then, let me actually get the quote so I'm, I get this correct. If the person has not placed regulated substances in the underground storage tank and has not dispensed regulated substances from the underground storage tank, so there are, there are provisions where the person can avoid some liability as an owner if they've never used the tank. The, that's um, 10.01.01A2, and there, there are further qualifications on that. So I think that's part of what a person in this day and age would conduct a phase one environmental due diligence to determine if there's a tank there and what sort of liability there would be for them, depending on the business plan they have for the property.
And I think the other, the only other issues that we really want to, that I need to get into is, is reiterate the fact that, that the recordation statute really only deals with constructive notice of the real property, not with the notice, with notice of the ownership of the UST. The underground storage tank was not indicated anywhere. The existence of an underground storage tank was not exhibited anywhere on the deed. So we have constructive notice that Mr. Arnett owned the real property, but even in constructive notice cases, constructive notice does not trump actual notice, and we have actual notice of the UST through the form that was submitted by Yellow Cab pursuant to 1002. And the, the department's policy hasn't changed in terms of how you, you still rely on self-reporting as opposed to running a absolutely a the. All, almost all um, environmental programs rely on self-reporting, not just underground storage tank. There are a variety of different programs. They almost become innumerable. Is, but, is, that, what, is that what other states do as well? Do you, do you have any idea? That's correct. Um, underground storage tank statutes and program in Arizona stem from the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which is a federal program, and they mirror, in essence, all of the, it's called RCRA, R-C-R-A. They mirror RCRA. And the federal program is enforceable nationwide by the EPA, and most states have their own underground storage tank programs that either have been delegated by the EPA to state enforcement, or the states have equivalent programs of their own. Arizona has an equivalent program. It's not a delegated program, but the statutory structure is essentially the same. But do you know if other states, as a matter of course, check uh, the deed to see who owns the property? As far as I know, every state has the same program that ADQ has. They, re they rely on the self-reporting. Each owner has the requirement to report the existence of the tank. As I said, the state programs all mirror the federal program. And if they don't, then the feds have their own program to go. Um, but all the states that I'm aware of have functionally the exact same program that Arizona has. And the Arizona program functionally is the equivalent of the federal program. Thank you. I am perplexed by the statement that a landowner can evade liability by delegating to the lessee. That's what Mr. Arnett tried to do. For purposes of imposing liability on him, uh, the state's taking the opposite position. Uh, for purposes of trying to avoid the effect of the notice statute, uh, they're saying that, well, just because we have notice of the ownership of the property doesn't mean that we necessarily know what the leasehold arrangements are or whether uh, one's a fixture or not. Uh, I submit that the default position, the presumption is that if you own the land, and you have notice of ownership of the land, you also have notice of the common law uh, law of fixtures, that you own everything on or under the land. Part two, let's assume that instead of a notice required by statute, that we simply have a Rule 26.1 requirement of disclosing relevant information. And as part of an initial disclosure in a 1995 uh, lawsuit, that Yellow Cab discloses all the documents that they have except for the deed to Mr. Arnett. The question now comes, can the state not do any discovery and say, well, we relied upon that uh, uh, disclosure and we don't have to do any depositions or ask for any specific documents or do no, dil and no responsibility to do diligence at all. Uh, and then they receive uh, you know, documents showing that uh, Yellow Cab uh, asks uh, or portrays itself only as the owner of the uh, of the tank and not of the underlying property. Well, what's your response though to the uh, the state's suggestion that each owner has an independent op obligation to um, to submit paperwork um, if if there's a UST on their on their property or if if they're an owner, whether you're an owner or operator under the under the statute that. You, ha you have that independent obligation to do well, that. Well, sure. Well, let's assume that Mr. Arnett did not know he was an owner because he, he uh, leased it all and they depreciate, Yellow Cab depreciated all the assets. Why would he have an obligation or believe that he did? Well, he was depreciating the, the tank 
Yes, yellow cab. Uh, no, yellow cab was. Yes, that, that's that's in the record. I think I'm done. Mr. Gurr, if you'd like to take a, a second or two or the, a concluding sentence or two, that's fine. You know, I would circle around and repeat myself to no effect, Your Honor, but thank you for the opportunity. Very good. Well, thank you both uh, for your argument today and your briefing. Uh, again, thank you for allowing us to start a little bit before the allotted time, or the specified time. We will take this matter under advisement and issue a decision, decision in due course. Thank you.